Welcome to Washed by the Word. I'm Pastor Khan, and I wanted to personally welcome you to our Sunday morning service as we go verse by verse through God's Word. It's our desire here by Washed by the Word that the Spirit of God will speak to you intimately as we go verse by verse through His Word. So welcome again to our Sunday morning service, and I look forward to hearing from all of you sharing with us what God has shown you today as you get washed by the Word. All right, we continue on in our study in 2 Samuel this morning. We'll be in 2 Samuel chapter 21. 2 Samuel chapter 21. As we get into 2 Samuel 21, we're going to be looking at, well, 21 today, but over the next couple of weeks, we'll be finishing out the book of 2 Samuel. These last four chapters, 21, 22, 23, and 24, we're going to see something kind of interesting. We're going to see David again represented the way we saw him in 1 Samuel and the first part of 2 Samuel. Remember, we saw him as a soldier. We saw him as a singer. And then, of course, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, we saw him as a sinner. And you can take 1 Samuel, the life of David, and kind of break his life into those three sections. Soldier, singer, sinner. The last four chapters, as we come to the end of his life now, we're going to see they are comprised the exact same way. We're going to see at the end of chapter 21, we're going to see David as a soldier, an old soldier. In chapters 22, 23, we're going to see him as a singer. And in chapter 24, we're going to see him as a sinner. So we'll keep that in mind as we finish up 2 Samuel. These last four chapters also close with two national calamities. We're going to see today a drought that will be linked, caused by Saul's sin. In chapter 24, we're going to see a plague caused by David's sin. So we're going to see these two national calamities, and we're going to be looking at that a little bit at the first part of chapter 21, and how to bring healing to a land when the leader of that land drifts into sin. Saul's sin is that he breaks a covenant. He breaks a promise. He becomes a liar. And we're going to see how Israel is able to remove that judgment that fell on the land, even though Saul had been dead for 30 years. God brings it to the forefront. That's what we'll be looking at today. So let's take a look as we get into chapter 21, verse 1. There we see, now there was a famine in the days of David. This is now when David's been restored to the throne. The kingdom's been united. Absalom's rebellion has been put down. David is there. And now a famine in the days of David for three years. And then I love what the Word of God does there. It says year after year. It just goes on and on and on. And then it says, after those three years, and David inquired of the Lord. It's amazing to me, David waited three years to inquire of the Lord God. need a little help here. But then I look at my own life, and we can look at our own lives, and how many difficulties do we go through? How many dry times do we go through personally because we refuse to seek, inquire of the Lord? It's kind of hard, but I got this. I'll figure this out, you know. Oh, man, guys, if we can get one thing today, one thing today. In fact, say that, one thing, one thing. If we can get one thing. If we can get that, we scored big time today. And that one thing is, if I'm dry, go to the Lord. If you feel further away from the Lord today than you did yesterday, last week, last, last month, make no mistake about who moved. If you're feeling dry, go to the Lord. Lord, I feel dry. Why? God, what's up? God, let your spirit, you know the thoughts and intents of my heart. Lord, why is it that I don't feel unity? Lord, why is it I don't, I don't feel close with you? Lord, your body, I used to love your body. Now your body's a pain in the neck. I'm church shopping. 
future shop and go buy one. That's good. <laughs> Have a blast. But I hate to tell you, no matter what church we go to, you know who always ends up there? Every time I do some church shopping, before I, when I was between pastorate, I went to a number of churches. The one problem I always found, no matter what church I went to, there was one person that was always there that caused problem in my life. You know who that was? Me! Uh -oh. I can't get away from me. You know? Go to the Lord. Lord, I feel far from you today. Don't pull with David. In three years he waited. What's interesting, there was this famine in the days of David for three years, year after year, and David inquired of the Lord. Notice the next sentence, and the Lord answered. Wow. I believe if he had asked, what's up, Lord, a week after, he had answered. But the Lord will keep it dry until we come to him. Remember the dry times aren't necessarily bad, they're just dry. And just like when you plant grass or sod, if you're from up north and you put sod down, you know that if you water it too much, the roots will turn up and start coming up for the water and it won't have deep roots. So sometimes dry times are good, but they should not go on extended period of time. You put sod down, you can, don't water it every day, but you do water it every three days. And if you're going three days without the Lord, you are going to dry up. If you're going without quiet times, you are going to dry up. Zay, you had quiet times this week. How did that work out for you? I got to hear you louder. Really good. Really good. Come up here. This is Zay. Everyone should know this guy. This guy is crazy amazing. <laughs> I didn't really know Zay too much. I just knew that he could do some crazy flips, and he stands here with this guitar, and he just kind of does this. And I know he's got cool hair. That's about all I knew about Zay. <laughs> After spending five days with Zay, I found out something about Zay, and that is he loves Jesus. Amen. He really does. Tell us about your quiet times. He didn't know I was going to do this to him. Janiah said, Pastor Khan, you're not going to call me up here. Not today, girl, but one day. Say, <laughs> so, I, I don't know. Tell him. Did you have quiet times? Yes. Did God show you anything during that time? Yes, he showed me a lot of things. Well, that'll work. What are they? Uh, <laughs> he showed me that um, if you want to be a Christian, you got to follow his word. And he also showed me that um, if... I mean, the price, all, I, all it is to me is it's so easy. All you have to do is just follow his word. You have to obey his word, follow his word in the Bible, and you go to heaven. Or, you know, you go to hell, you know, suffer the rest of your life, you know, in your th thoughts, you know. So it's, it's your choice to see what you want to go to heaven with God, spend the rest of your eternity with him, and just love him, have a good time with him. Or do you want to spend time with hell and just suffer the rest of the eternity with your thoughts and decisions you made out of your whole life. Okay, that's what I Thanks. Thank you, buddy. One of the things that became very evident as we spend time with the kids, you can see the gifts just percolating in the kids. Zay's got a strong gift of evangelism. I mean, it's just crazy. Now, he had to stand up. Think about when you were 13. Think when you were 13, standing up in front of 150 plus people on the spot and say, okay, tell us what God showed you. Very good, man. You did good. Zay's got a real strong gift of evangelism. Ethan has a really strong teaching gift, it appears. I don't know where you are, Ethan. This is cool. I can't find you. There you are. Ethan seemed to have a teaching gift. It was pretty, pretty amazing just to listen to him. It was, it was like awesome. It was awesome. Darren seemed to have the gift of exhortation. A couple of times he went crazy up there. It was awesome. He just said, this is what he is. And psh, I'm thinking of the one in specifically. He just sat up in strong exhortation. Chance, I don't know what in the world. I don't know where Chance is. There, you way back there. Chance, we're still determining what he has, but whatever it is, it's pretty stinking good. Chance makes you laugh, makes you feel good. He has a gift of helps. He, makes, he definitely makes you laugh. Uh, there seems to be a little bit of a prophetic thing going on with Chance. It's just amazing to see. It's just amazing to see. So after spending five days with the boys a lot, that's what I see in those four boys. It's amazing to see. Great, great kids. But it's amazing if you spend time with the Lord and get quiet, he will speak, will he not? You have to shut your phones off to do it. On the trip, we had the kids unplug. They couldn't bring any social media at all. So there were no phones, no iPads, nothing. And they, they survived. In fact... The kids liked it, it seemed, more than the parents. Some of the parents were like, what? How am I going to get in touch with my kids? You're not going <laughs> to. What? <laughs> but it worked well. 
it worked well. So I'm just proud of the kids, really proud of them. David inquired of the Lord and the Lord answered. Too often, we don't go to the Lord with our problems. We go to other people with our problems. The problem going to other people is they don't have the answer. Amen. Don't come to me with your problems. Go to the Lord with problems. You come to me, it's, 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 my flesh is so crazy, I'll start thinking I have the answers. And if you start doing what I tell you to do instead of what the Bible tells you to do, if you start doing what I tell you to do instead of what the Lord tells you to do, we are then crossing from the position of a church into a cult. We're not going to be a cult. The pastor doesn't tell you what to do. The Lord tells you what to do. He's the great counselor. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm here to serve you. I'm here to serve. Pastor Anthony is here to serve. Pastor Walter is here to serve. Pastor Gill is here to serve. Not to lead, to serve. Not to dictate, to serve. To serve. That's what pastors do. They serve. Servant leadership. You've heard it said, there's always room at the back of the line. Well, don't seek counsel from anybody but the Lord. That's where you go. And when you go to counselors, we have counselors here. But when you go to counselors, they're going to point you to the Lord. They're going to point you to Jesus. They're going to encourage you to get into the word and see what God has for you all. There was famine in the days of David for three years, year after year, and David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered. And he said, it is because of Saul and his bloodthirsty house. Oh, that's not good. Because he killed the Gibeonites. He killed the Gibeonites. Saul is such an enigma. Saul is one of these leaders. You go like, what in the world? You look at Saul, he appears godly. But yet at the same time, this man who appears godly, he appears to be called by God, placed there by God, but yet he makes foolish vows. Foolish vows that are impossible to keep. He does it over and over and over again. It's like, what are you doing? Remember he was commanded to slay the Amalekites from God through Samuel? Take out the Amalekites. Did he take out the Amalekites? No, I'm not going to do that. No. Instead, he tries to exercise ethnic cleansing on the Gibeonites. And we say, so? Well, it's the Gibeonites. Remember in Joshua chapter 9, it was the Gibeonites. Joshua is coming into the promised land. He's had this tremendous victory in Jericho. He eventually had a tremendous victory in Ai. And they're back looking wounds. You know the whole story. We've done that many times. Joshua and his conquering of the promised land and all. But remember in chapter 9, while they're there, they're coming on in, all of a sudden, here come these old guys, old saddlebags on these camels. They got old moldy bread and their clothes are all warm. Man, they've been on the road a long time. They stink. It smells so like our room did after the fourth day, remember guys? There was this, there was this odor. There was this odor about them. You know, it was just like, oh, man. And they came up over the hill and they said, oh, are you Joshua and the Israelites? Yeah, that's us. Oh, man, we've heard what you did in Egypt. We heard what you did with the Sion, the king of the Amorites, and Og of Bashan. He doesn't talk, they don't talk about Jericho or Ai because that's recent stuff. And they've been on the road so long, they don't know about that, you understand. But we heard about that and we just wanted to come to you and make an agreement with you, and we just want to be part of you, and uh, we won't cause any problems. We just need your protection because, man, you guys are amazing. And, and it says Joshua and the leaders did not inquire of the Lord. They said, well, yeah, that makes good sense. Look, they've been on the road a long time. Old bread, old clothes, old shoes. They're all dirty and stinky. Yeah, we'll enter an agreement. And they entered in a covenant, an agreement with these people. And the next day they go to conquer more land. They come over the hill and say, oh, here's a city here. Let's take out this city. And the people they just made a covenant with that had been traveling for weeks and months, you know, they said, can't do that city. That's our city. You got a covenant with us. You're not going to attack us. That's us. You can't do that. And they go, ah, oh, let's kill them. And Josh says, no, 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 no. We made a promise before God. We made a vow before God that we're going to protect these guys. Yeah, but we didn't know about this. We made a vow before God. We didn't know it would be like this. We made a vow before God. Yeah, but I didn't know she was going to be like this. You made a vow before God. Well, I didn't know he'd be like, we made a vow before God. And Joshua says, no, we made a vow before God. This is lifetime. We have to protect you now. You're going to be part of us, like we said, but you're going to serve us. You're going to be 
woodcutters, and water carriers for the worship of our God. You can become part of us. You're part of us, guys. And they become part of the children of Israel, the Gibeonites. With the promise of vow made before God, we will protect you. If you go into 1 Chronicles, we're not going to go there today, but you might jot this down if you like to study. If you go to 1 Chronicles chapter 8, 29 to 33, and 1 Chronicles 9, 35 to 39, we see something really interesting because the Gibeonites, they settle in the tribe of Benjamin area. And in those verses I just gave you, we see that the Gibeonites actually intermarried with the children of Israel. Not only that, Guess who one of the Gibeonites' sons was? Kish. Guess who Kish's son was? Saul. Saul's grandpa was a Gibeonite. And yet here we see, it's not recorded in Scripture, just here, that God said Saul tried to destroy the Gibeonites. He tried to genocide on his own family, if you will. Tried to take out the Gibeonites. By covenant, they were to be protected. Saul turns on him. He turns on him. He tried to fix this deception, if you will, by taking him out. And the Lord answered, it is because of Saul and his bloodthirsty house, because he killed the Gibeonites. So the king, speaking of David, called the Gibeonites, the ones that were not victims of ethnic cleansing. So the king called the Gibeonites and he spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. The children of Israel had sworn protection to them. But Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal for the children of Israel and Judah. Therefore, David said to the Gibeonites, what shall I do for you? And with what shall I make atonement? There's been drought in the land for three years again. David has sought the Lord. The Lord says, because of what Saul did 30 years ago to the Gibeonites, David goes to the Gibeonites, what shall I do for you? To make atonement that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord. And the Gibeonites said to him, we will have no silver or gold from Saul. We don't want any stinking money. We don't want your money or from his house. We don't want that. Nor shall you kill any man in Israel for us. That's no, there's been enough bloodshed that way. He says, whatever you say, I will do for you, King David tells him. Then they answered the king, as for the man who consumed us, that would be Saul, and plotted against us, that would be Saul, that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the territories of Israel, that would be Saul. Let seven men of his descendants be delivered to us. Let seven of his grandkids be delivered to us. And we will hang them before the Lord. In other words, it will be done in the will of God. The price will be paid for what he has done. There will be judgment on his house because of the sin of their grandfather. Let seven men of his descendants be delivered to us. We will hang them before the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, right in his hometown, whom the Lord chose. And the king said, I will give them. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan. Remember Mephibosheth, the one with the crippled feet? Remember the covenant David had made with Jonathan years prior that if something happened to Jonathan, he would take care of his kids? And if something happened to David, Jonathan would take care of his kids, remember? And David had done that. Remember, he went to Lo Debar and got Mephibosheth, put him at his table. Remember, we talked about Ziba. We did the whole thing. Remember, you remember that. He says, but the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the Lord's oath that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. So the king took Armoni and Mephibosheth, not the same Mephibosheth. This was Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, up earlier. This is going to be Mephibosheth, the son of Rizpah, who was the daughter of Aya, who she bore to Saul. So this is a different Mephibosheth. And we hear that sometimes and we go, that's so crazy. Why would they name two kids Mephibosheth? When we were at the Ranger game this past year, George Bush was there and his wife. So we got to see him up on the screen and everything. He was there in his little box. I mean, why in the world would people have someone of the same name in the same family? How confusing. Oh yeah, wait a minute. George Bush has a dad. I forget his first name, but he was president too, was he not? Anybody know George Bush's dad's name, the first? It was George too. Ah, two Georges. Two Mephibosheths. 
Not a big deal. So don't make it weirder than it is. It's just Mephibosheth and Mephibosheth. It was a popular name. You're going to have another, you have a baby boy, Mephibosheth. There you go. <laughs> so the king took Armoni and Mephibosheth, the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Ea, who she bore to Saul, and the five sons of Michal, the daughter of Saul, whom she brought up for Adriel, the son of Barzillai, the, Methel, the Maholothite. Okay. And he delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites. Can you imagine? You talk about an uh-oh moment. Could you imagine that? I need seven descendants of Saul, and they're looking at you. That's uh-oh. Yeah, that's woo, right. That's, that's serious. But here they come. He, he brings them to the Gibeonites, and they hang them on the hill before the Lord. So they fell, all seven together, and were put to death in the days of harvest, in the first days, in the beginning of the barley harvest, in the beginning of the barley harvest. Now Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, took sackcloth and spread it for herself on the rock. From the beginning of that barley harvest until the late rains poured on them from heaven, that's almost a six-month period, most people believe. And she did not allow the birds of the air to rest on them. She wouldn't allow the, the ravens and the vultures to eat at the bodies that are hanging. They're just letting them hang there all this time as they decay publicly. Can you imagine? Nor the beasts of the field by night. She chased away the coyotes and anything else, the jackals, whatever would come and try and eat the bodies. They just, she chased them away from her kids. Can you imagine? I cannot imagine a mother's heart how broken that had to be. And David was told what Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, had done, the concubine of Saul, what she had done. Then David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son. Remember, Saul, Jonathan were killed by the Philistines, remember, on Mount Gilboa? And remember, the Philistines took their bodies and strapped them up to the walls at bet -Sheon, remember? We talked about that, remember? Those of you who went to Israel this year, remember, we saw that part. Uh, David, were you the one that went up the hill there at bet -Sheon? You climbed up that hill at bet -Sheon to the, the old tell up there. It was up where you climbed up on top, that wall that was buried in that tell, that's where the bodies of Saul and Jonathan were stuck on that wall there. And we talked about the Jabesh Gileadites. Remember how they went and got him? We said, why the Jabesh Gileadites? We went through the whole history of Jabesh Gilead and the tribe of Benjamin. And the tribe of Benjamin, the book of Judges, was almost wiped out. Remember, we talked about this a couple of months ago. And remember, they needed wives because, are they needed? Yeah, they needed wives because the tribe was almost gone. There weren't enough women to keep the tribe of Benjamin populated. And they looked for someone who had not entered into an agreement that we're not going to give our daughters to the Benjamites. And they found Jabesh Gilead had not entered into it. So they took wives from the Jabesh Gileadites so that the Benjamites actually had a blood relationship with the Jabesh Gileadites. And now here's Saul from the tribe of Benjamin on the wall, his body and Jonathan, their bodies on the walls at bet -Sheon, And the Jabesh Gileadites risked their lives to come across the Jordan River to go to bet -Sheon, take their bodies off the wall, and bury them back in Jabesh Gilead. Why? Because that was family. That was family. They had a strong connection with the Benjamites. So now they've been buried there for all these years, 30 years they've been buried there. And it says here, then David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from the men of Jabesh Gilead, who had stolen them from the street of bet -Sheon. stolen them in a good way. They stole them from the Philistines because they were desecrating their bodies, where the Philistines had hung them up after the Philistines had struck down Saul and Gilboa. So David brought up the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from there, and they gathered the bones of those who had been hanged. They're completely decomposed now. And they buried the bones of Saul and Jonathan, his son, in the country of Benjamin in Zilah, in the tomb of Kish, his father. So they performed all that the king commanded. And after that, God heeded the prayer for the land. Isn't that something? Once they took care of this un- taken care of issue. Once these skeletons were taken care of, and you know, those skeletons hindered their relationship with God. And I am convinced that each of us in this room today, many of us have spiritual skeletons in our closet. Things that we have not put to rest. We've just kind of put it away and closed the door and said, forget about it. It's just, it'll go away. Well, 30 years later, still not gone away, guys. It doesn't go away. God does not forget because we do, or we try to. And spiritual skeletons can hinder our relationship with God. Whether it's a spiritual skeleton from when we were a child, a spiritual skeleton when we were a young adult, 
a spiritual skeleton from last week, whatever it might be, that which we have not dealt with, that which we have not taken care of. Saul and the children of Israel, Saul after his death actually, but the children of Israel found that sin will catch up with us. Sin will come to completion. It's interesting that the Gibeonites asked for seven of Saul's descendants, the number of completion. They said, we're going to take care of this. It will be seven. Not six, not four, not nine, seven. This number of completion, we're going to deal for this once and for all. We will have complete restoration here. On the trip with the kids, one of the, the verses we looked at from our First Thessalonians study was in the book of Numbers, Numbers 32, 23, where it says, you know, you've sinned against the Lord, but don't forget, your sin will find you out. It doesn't say the Lord will find you out. It says your sin will find you out. You see, the Lord forgives our sin. Our sin was judged on the body of Jesus Christ. But if we have unconfessed sin, if we have unfinished business, if we have spiritual skeletons, it is our sin that will find us out. The Lord already knows. But our sin will, the consequence of those sins that have not been dealt with, those sins that we try to put behind a closed door, that sin that we try to hide, that will find us out. That will come to the forefront. But when we bring our sin to Jesus Christ, we confess our sin to him, whatever that sin is, if it's 30 years ago, if it's 30 minutes ago, and we confess it as sin and laid at the foot of the cross, Jesus has died for that sin and it's gone. We're under the new covenant. We talk about it all the time, the new covenant. Out of Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. You remember it, guys. We talk about it almost every week where God says there's going to be a new covenant that I'm going to establish. And I will forgive their sins and I will remember them no more. Isn't that, that's like stinking awesome. He will remember. God chooses to forget our sins if we confess them. Man, I'm liking that way too much. That's amazing. And it was Jesus, remember, who said on the night that he was betrayed at that last, we call it the Last Supper, when he said, this is the blood of the, the new covenant. As he established that new covenant that God had spoken to his children through the prophet Jeremiah. We're under a new covenant. We confess our sins, it's gone. But the enemy, our own pride, so often, rather than bringing him to Jesus, we put him in a closet and we close the door and we forget about it. We don't deal with it. And that spiritual skeleton is the one thing are those 10 skeletons in our closet. Who knows how many we got in there? That is what the enemy has in us. Remember, it was Jesus who said, he has nothing in me. You can leave here today, guys, with nothing that the enemy can get to you with just by opening up those stinking old doors. They're going to be cobwebbed up. Open them up. Spiritually speaking, take that skeleton out. Lay it at the foot of the cross. Amen. God already knows it's there. Amen. He's not going to be surprised. He knows it's there. It's a matter of us acknowledging it's there, laying at the cross. He's going to forget about it. So should we. Forget about it. We don't come to hear someone's testimony hearing how bad someone was. Man, we all got junk in the trunk. Get rid of the junk. Amen. Put it at the foot of the cross. When you hear a testimony, I don't want to hear how bad you were because you weren't that bad anyway. We all think we're way worse than we ever were. You know how it is. But forget about that. I don't want to hear how bad you are. I want to hear how good Jesus is. God, I want to hear what Jesus has done in your life since you've come to Christ. That's a testimony. What has God done in my life? That's a testimony. Amen. Don't care about what you've done. That's between you and God. And the good thing is, once you've done it and you place it at the foot of the cross and confess it as sin and turn from it, you can go back and tell God, I want to confess that sin again. He goes, there's no sin here. I don't know what you're talking about, man. Because he chooses to forget your sin. He sees you as sin-free. How sweet, how awesome, how amazing is our God. Amen. That's your God, man. That's your God. Whew, that's pretty good right there. That's pretty good right there. I don't care who you are. That's pretty good right there. Man, amazing, amazing. Spiritual skeletons have got to be buried properly. Give them the proper burial at the foot of the cross. Then you'll find your prayers will be answered. It's an amazing thing. Not only on a personal level, but on a national level. 
We talk about this so often. Let's look at it one more time. We're going to jump out of the text. I don't like to jump out too much. We're going to jump out just for a quick second. We're going to run over into 2 Chronicles. You know this verse. We're going to go a little bit before it and a little bit after it. We're going to go to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. We'll go to verse 12. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night. Now Solomon is the new king. He's appeared to him once. Remember, whatever you want, Solomon, I'm going to give to you the first time, remember. And Solomon says, I just want wisdom to lead your people. And God goes, Solomon, you're a you're bomb, man. That's awesome. You could ask for a long life. You could ask for money. You could ask for smarts. You ask for wisdom to lead my people. Because you ask for that, I'm going to give you wisdom, but... I'm going to give you the money you didn't ask for. I'm going to ask you, give you the long life you didn't ask for. I'm going to give you, the, oh, Solomon, I'm dumping it all on you, man. And I'm going to make you the wisest person that ever lived or ever will live. Solomon, you've got the wisdom. Well, now here in chapter 7, the Lord appeared to Solomon by night. And he said to him, I have heard your prayer, Solomon, and have chosen this place. He's dedicating, getting ready to dedicate the temple and all. And I've chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain, remember, we're looking at drought for three years. Now God says, when I shut up heaven, this is in the future, again, he's dealing with Solomon now. When I shut up heaven, there is no rain. Or if I command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people. Whoa, we've got to remember that. Drought, in quote, climate change, hurricanes, fires, God is in control. And throughout scripture, God uses these things to get his people's attention. For David, it took three years. It appears the United States has taken around 65 years. We need to wake up. We need to wake up. You see the floods in New Jersey? This morning, I was looking at the floods. Oh my gosh. Fires in California. Drought. Hurricanes going to be coming. You know that. Brian running around trying to help everywhere he goes. Where are you, Brian, right there? Stand up, Brian. People should know about this because you're doing it quietly. Let's just take a little bit from you. There's Brian right there. He's very involved in Samaritan's Purse. Rita, Robert and Rita, you're here. Stay standing. Robert and Rita, where are you? There you guys are. These guys are, I don't want to say officers, but you're kind of in, like sergeants in Samaritan's Purse, I guess is the way to put it. They kind of head it up. This is the Rita we've been praying for with the bruised rib. She fell when she was up in Iowa. Was it tornadoes you guys are working with this time? Tornadoes in Iowa. You just got back from, you were roughing it where in Hawaii? <laughs> was, that the, was that the volcano thing or what was it? No, the, flooding. the flooding. The flooding in Hawaii. Just signed off papers for Brian. You're going to go Lord willing where next? Uh, tomorrow to where? Redding. Redding, California. Tomorrow? And then you got Bermuda on the horizon. Is that right? Or? Oh, Bar Barbuda. Okay, so Barbuda. He just keeps going. They keep going. And it's just amazing. Many of you have gone in Samaritan Purse one time here, one time there, one time there. That's who you talk to. Robert and Rita will hook you up. And if you say, well, I don't know, uh, Pastor Anthony will definitely hook you up because he's our missions guy. But if you want to get involved in Samaritan Purse, long term or short term, correct? Either one. You want to go for a week, you want to go for, like Brian's doing, like all the time, uh, it's up to you. But it's there for you. It's another opportunity. You want to get involved in missions? We got Bulgaria once a year. We got Haiti. How many times a year? Twice a year. We got Honduras. Mindy comes home next month or this month? Next month. So Mindy's this month. So in August, 30th of August. So Mindy's coming back, but she's down in Hon Honduras. Yeah, she's in Honduras at the orphanage down there. Um, you guys have been down there for what? Three months at a time. Sometimes, sometimes longer than that. Pastor Anthony, you've been down there twice now. Once. Once there in Haiti, way too many times. We have Haiti people going all the time down to Haiti. It's amazing. It's amazing. You've got tons of opportunity. So um, use it, man. Take advantage. But here it is. All these things, remember, God's in control. We need to pray. And it's not God take, care, take away the hurricanes. It's God, what is going on? Why are you judging us so hard as a people? Anybody have an answer? Maybe, I don't know. Maybe God will speak to you on that. But here's this answer here, which is pretty good. He says, when I do this, if I cause drought, locusts, pestilence, he says, if my people, 
Now, the first issue, who are my people? In this context, it's the nation of Israel. In America, I would say it's people who take the name of Jesus for real. True Christians. True Christians. If my people who are called by my name, number one, will humble themselves. That's number one. And I think we need to practice around here humbling ourselves, guys. The first thing to humble ourselves, pride is so deceptive and so wretched. I want you to understand, Washed by the Word is a small little dinky church. We're like a little thread on the garment of Christianity in the world. And there are so many good churches worldwide. There are so many good churches in this city. Some are really big. Some of these big mega churches are bomb, man. They're awesome. Some of the churches in this town are so small and they're bomb. They're awesome. The quality of the church does not depend on the number of people that come. It doesn't. I've had an opportunity to pastor a big church. I've had an opportunity to pastor a small church. And now I don't know what this is. We're just like a middle, middle church. The average size church, they said in the United States right now is around 75 to 80 people. So we're almost twice the size of the average church. We're getting big. But at any rate, it's just one of those things. But it's just, it's, 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 it doesn't make any difference. There are so many good churches. Pride says, but we're the best. Ultra pride says, we're the only ones. You cannot make a decision, Jim, without first checking with me, man. Man, run. Run from me at that point. Run from me. I have got some serious insecurity issues, and I'm full of pride. Run from me. Just run. No, no, no. There are so many good churches. You're free to go to any church you want to go. We are thrilled that you're here today. That's awesome. Man, we love it here. But we don't want to get in a position where we say, if you don't go here, you're backslidden. No, you're not. You're just going somewhere else. Some people like Burger King. Some people like McDonald's. Some people like Wendy's. They're all good. Not good for you, but they taste good. <laughs> Come on, I got to get a hand. I got to get that on there. Okay, so. <laughs> but it's, churches are churches, man. Just make sure you're being fed the word of God, not some pastor doctrine. Get fed the word of God. Make sure you're being loved and you have an opportunity to get used. And if you can get loved, used, and fed, you're going to grow and you're going to tell others about the place you're going to grow. Just get loved, fed, and used. And life is good. The first thing he says, they got to humble, humble ourselves. they got to humble themselves. Well, as church folk, we need to humble ourselves. There are good churches all over the place. Go wherever you want to go. We're thrilled you're here. You don't have to come here. We're glad you're here. You're welcome here. But you'll be welcome in any church in town. We just think it's cool you're here right now. That's, that's awesome. If God wants you here, we want you here. If he doesn't want you here, there's the door. Go, it's okay. Go to where God wants you to go. No hard feelings. We're just going to love you. We're just going to love you. That's it. There are so many good churches in this town, man. There are so many good churches in this country. There are so many good churches in this world. What a privilege, as I said, to be a thread in this garment of Christianity all over the world. It's like amazing. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, number one, and pray, number two. We humble ourselves. We are not all that. We humble ourselves. We're sinners who love Jesus, who have been forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we're going to love them. But if we can get that, we're not going to judge one another. How, I don't know who you are, but I'm loving the hair. But if, uh, it's a great head. But, Likewise. yeah, I tell you, I don't know who you are. What's your name, man? Elias. 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 Yes. E-L-I-A-S. Yes, sir. I love that name, but I love that hairstyle. That's good. <laughs> That's it. fantastic. I just got to say that because it was like, I've been looking at it the whole time and said, man, that guy's got a good looking head. I like the hair. I like the hair. <laughs> But the fact that Elias comes in and he's got this little bit here, I'm not so sure about that because I can't grow that. And since I can't grow that, I don't like that. You understand? <laughs> That's just how that works, you know? Sort of like Walter's head. I, you know, he's got this hair up here. I can't grow that. So I don't like that. You know, that's, that's that kind of deal? That's how that works. But if we can truly realize and admit that we're sinners that we don't have it figured out. All we know is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. 
What we know is he died for our sins. We know he rose from the dead. And we know that if we place our faith in Jesus Christ, our sins will be forgiven and we will be born again according to what Jesus calls it. And we will have a new life in Christ. And we know that we're, we're going to be recognized as his disciples because of the love we share one for another, not because we're perfect, but because Jesus is. Amen. And if we can grasp that, that we're sinners, then how can I say anything bad about Elias and judge Elias because he's no different than I am? We're two sinners. I like to judge Elias because if I can convince Walter that Elias isn't quite as good as me, somehow I feel better about me. And that's called sin. We don't do that. We're just going to love Elias, even if he does have these little hairs that he forgot to shave right here. <laughs> but it's okay, because we're just going to love him. We're just going to love him. That's all it's going to be. So do you understand? We don't judge one another. We don't gossip about one another. When we do that, we're talking about ourselves, man, and that's wrong. Don't do that. Don't do that. Just love one another. Just love one another. Just love one another. Just love one another. Those on the trip, can anybody here, the one on the trip, stand up real quickly and quote the Apostle John's last message? Anybody got it? Ethan, you got it? Come up here. Let's hear it. Got to come over here. We had the kids memorize the Apostle John's last message. He was an old, old dude. And he had come off the island of Patmos, and he um, was getting ready to die. And can you imagine the word going out? The Apostle John is going to be speaking at church tonight. Oh, it'd be full. I'm sure it was. And they carried him up on a stretcher. Did you memorize it? Yes, sir. I asked the kids to memorize the Apostle John's last message. Love, just love. One another. That's it. <laughs> love, just love, one another. That's it. There was the message. That was his last message. He came out. He said, love, just love one another, and they carried him off. That was it. His last message, just love one another. Stop judging. Ain't nobody got time for that. Don't be judging. Don't be judging. Just loving. Just love, 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 love. Don't be gossiping. If I gossip, it's a reflection on me. If you gossip, it's a reflection on you. If we love one another, it's a reflection on Jesus. Let's reflect Jesus. Let's just love one another. Anybody in here perfect? Okay, then, now we know. We can always pick apart everybody. That's easy. The trick is, is to look at each other and see people how Jesus sees them. Just love them. Just love them. Just love them. If my people are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. We talk about praying. We study about praying. We read about praying. We promise we're going to pray. We do everything except pray. Stop talking about praying. Stop promising to pray. Just pray. Amen. Just pray. Miss Christina comes up to me and says, Pastor, pray for me. I got a test tomorrow. I'll pray for you. No, I won't. I know me. I might, I might not. I'll probably forget. And then she'll come back three days later. I passed the test. Thanks for praying for me. And you got that feeling? Everybody had that feeling? I didn't pray for you. <laughs> Anybody besides me ever have that? Look at us. See, see how we are? That's how we are. We're just crazy that way. So don't do that. So come up and tell me that. Just say that. Pastor, pray for my testimony. Pastor, pray for me. Okay, let's pray. Right there. Right there. Pray right there. This place should have little pockets of people praying all over the place all the time. Just, hey, will you pray for me? Okay, what do you need prayer for? Just pray for me. Well, I need to know how to pray. No, I don't. God knows. Amen. Just bring my, okay, our eyes met Liz. So Liz, come. Pastor, pray for me. Well, tell me all about it, Liz, so I know how to pray. No. Pray for you. <laughs> Pray for Liz right there. God, you know what's going on in Liz's heart, in her mind, in her life. God, we're asking your spirit to come upon her. God, show yourself so strong for her. Draw her so close in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bam. You prayed for somebody. That's how you pray for somebody. Don't get in all the gobbly gook and all. That's for our flesh. We just want to know so we can get nosy. <laughs> Don't have to know the details. God knows the details. We just bring her forward. If my people humble themselves, we're not all that. We'll pray, actually pray, and seek the face of God. This last week, we spent five days helping our teens find how to seek the face of God, letting them see that they could seek the face of God. And if they did that, God would speak to them. Star, come up here real quick. Bam, here we go. 
Star was the oldest one on the trip. She's going to El Dorado High School. Just found out. Yeah. yeah. Ready? Real close. Did God speak to you on this trip at all? Yes, sir. Okay, tell us. Um, well, he spoke to me most about because um, I go to a public school, and of course there's a lot of bad influences, and I do try to be the light, but I just need to learn how to find new friends, and not so much if I fit in, but if I do have a little group that believes in God. And I do have friends that don't believe in God, but do bad stuff. I don't do the bad stuff with them, but there are temptations. There are different things that I see in them. And even though I'm not doing it with them, I'm still falling into like temptation and stuff. And I just think God spoke to me about that, to not even hang around people like that, to just... Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. That's like stinking <laughs> awesome. Thank you, girl. What's amazing is God showed her that. You know, if Pastor Khan or Mr. James or Miss Connie or Miss Christina told her that, well, she goes to school, we're not around, forget about it. God told her that. That is something that's went into her heart, and now you just told 150-some people. Ho, ho! But at any rate, there she is. I wasn't expecting that, but that's way good. That a girl. So there it is. Do you realize God speaks to us when we just unplug and spend time alone with the Lord? Amen. That works for kids. It works for adults. We just spend time with the Lord. Seek the face of God. If we humble ourselves, if we truly pray, if we seek the face of God, and then he says, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and will heal their land. Turning from their wicked ways, known as repenting. Skeletons will hinder our relationship with God. We need to recognize that we have them. We have to repent from them. Retribution. We have to go back to some of those skeletons. Some of those skeletons, we need to talk to the person involved with that skeleton and say, I was wrong. Will you forgive me? It is not, I'm sorry. I'm sorry is not asking for forgiveness. That's saying, I feel bad about it. Deal with it. Pastor Walsh is on the front row. Sorry, man, there you are. But I come up and step on his toe on purpose because of the flowing hair. But, <laughs> but if I step on that toe, I know I stepped on that toe. But I know it's in a packed room. He's not going to say anything, so I got by with it. Then God convicts me a little bit. So I go to Walter and say, Walter, I know I stepped on your toe. Sorry. And walk away. He's left as well. Okay. But if I say sorry, I am talking down to him. I'm basically saying deal with it. But if I go to him and say, Walter, God has convicted me how wrong I was stepping on your toe. Will you forgive me? Now I am taking a humble position to him. I am getting down lower than him. And I'm putting the ball in his court. And I'm saying, will you forgive me? Now he can say yes or no. That's up to him. If he says, no, I'm not going to forgive you, I'm going to get up and say, I love you, buddy. God bless you. And I'm going to start praying for Walter because if he won't forgive me, God's going to deal with him. But I'm clean. I am so clean. I have asked for forgiveness. But typically, typically, when you ask for forgiveness, the person will say, yes, I forgive you. Well, not only forgive, but they will forget. Because they say in their Lord's, we call the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. God said when he forgives, he's going to forgive and forget. So if someone comes to me and asks for my forgiveness, I want to forgive and forget. Because I don't want God to forgive and remember. When I say forgive me the way I forgive others, that's not good. I'm, no, I'm going to forgive and forget. You see, when we say, well, I'll forgive you, but I just can't forget, we're not forgiving. Now we've got to confess the sin of unforgiveness. Makes sense, kind of. 
So if we humble ourselves, we pray, we seek the face of God, and we turn from our wicked ways, we repent, we truly turn, then God says, I'm going to hear. I'm going to forgive their sin and heal their land. So we pray for our nation, just as David, or da uh, Daniel did when he identified with the nation of Israel and their sin. We, we pray for our nation. Our nation has been embedded in sin for so well, all my lifetime. Amen. We need to ask for forgiveness for our nation. We need to start placing our faith not in Washington, not in Santa Fe, not in City Hall, but in Jesus Christ. Amen. We place our faith in Jesus and we ask God to heal our land. We need to humble ourselves, we need to pray, we need to seek his face and turn from our wicked ways. The way it happens, guys, for real, is you draw a circle. You stand in the middle of that circle and you pray for everything in that circle. We cannot bring about a national repentance, but we can bring about a personal repentance. And if we do that, God is all ears. It starts with us individually. And it goes from there. It goes from there. Back into 2 Samuel. We're not going to finish 2 Samuel 21 today, but that's okay. We just won't. So, after that, God heeded the prayer for the land. When David dealt with the spiritual skeletons, God started listening again. 30 year, a 30-year-old sin. It's a true cold case. God brought it to the attention of the leadership. It was dealt with. And God said, okay, now let's go forward. I believe there are some of us here today that we have skeletons that we're not talking about. It could be who knows what, but let's just deal with them today. Not publicly, not out loud. You and the Lord, one-on-one. -on -one. Just confess the sin that we've buried, the sin that we thought we got by with. Just confess it to the Lord. Lay it at the feet of the cross, at the foot of the cross, at the feet of Jesus. Lay it there. Confess it as sin, repent of it, receive forgiveness. If there's retribution that needs to take place, you need to restore, then do it. But you will be restored in your walk with the Lord. It'll be gone. You'll be set free. I'm going to have the worship team come up in just a minute. And we're going to uh, just have a time to get right. We're going to pray. And I'm going to encourage you, and it might be hurtful. I mean, you might have been a victim. You might say, I didn't do anything wrong. And you've been hanging on that for years. But you know, you know that's a skeleton in there, and you know you have not dealt with that. I want to encourage you today, deal with it. Deal with it. Deal with it. Just go to Jesus. He loves you so much. He's ready to just restore you into a great relationship. You can get that closet emptied out. You can have a proper burial for that crazy spiritual skeleton. And you can go forward <sighs> fresh, forgiven, clean. I want to encourage you. During this prayer, if you have a spiritual skeleton, I'm going to say if you've got a skeleton, if there's a closet that needs to be opened up, I'm going to say, just raise your hand if you need to. I'm not going to have you come up front. I'm not going to have you stand up. I just want you to raise your hand as a way of saying, I'm going to do it. And then we're going to give you a chance to do it. Everyone's going to still be praying. But by raising your hand, you're kind of saying, okay, I'm doing it now. I've got a skeleton I need to deal with. Or maybe a boatload of skeletons, whatever they are. Let's pray. This is an opportunity. You're going to be in a loving environment with a loving Savior right there, ready to forgive. That thing that you've just brushed under the rug. That thing you stuck in a closet. Let's get it cleaned up. Let's give it a proper burial so we can go forward with an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Nothing between us. Let's not allow the enemy to have something in us. Let's get it out. So you raise your hand. and We'll give you a moment right where you're at just to get it cleaned up. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this time to get together. God, thank you for each one here. I thank you for their heart. I thank you for their smiles, their love for you. And Lord, right now, as we just get ready to uh, 
just deal with some business that needs to be dealt with in our own life, God. We're, we're asking that your spirit would just come upon us. You'd convict us of our sin. Lord, convict us of our spiritual skeletons, those things that we have kind of put behind closed doors. Lord, maybe we were victimized, and Lord, we've not really forgiven the person that victimized us. In fact, no one even knows about it. But Lord, we're just ready to forgive and to go on. Lord, maybe we've been deceived by a boss or by whatever. And there's that root of bitterness that just sits in there, but we're caught. Lord, we just need to get rid of that. Lord, we want to just confess that to you as that skeleton that we just keep behind closed doors. We want to bring it out, lay it at the foot of Jesus, and truly forgive and to go forward. Maybe it's something in our marriage that happened before we were married or after we were married, and there's been this root of bitterness that just separates we just need to lay that at the foot of the cross so that we can have a loving relationship in our marriage and with our kids and our grandkids and let all that go. Whatever it might be. I'm going to ask that right now the Spirit of God would work in our lives. That we'd go back there and open up that closed door that we have kept closed all these years. Open it up. Take that skeleton out. Lay it at the foot of the cross. Give it to Jesus. Forgive. Get up and walk away. And if you're here this morning and you say, you know, I've got a skeleton or two I need to deal with. And I'm ready to do it, Pastor. I'll pray with you. Just lead me in that prayer. I'm ready to do it. I want you to raise your hand. Hold it up high for a minute and say, I've got a skeleton. God bless you. Anybody else? We got some skeletons coming up. Anybody else? Let's deal with the skeletons. Don't mess this, don't miss this opportunity, guys. You can put them back down, but if there's anybody else, raise up a hand. Say, pray for me. I'm going to pray with you. Anybody else? Anybody else? God bless you. God bless you. Those of you that raised your hand, let's, let's deal with this once and for all. Let's get set free. Let's have a proper burial. So pray in your heart something like this. God, I come to you with this issue or these issues. God, you know what they are. And now in the quietness of your heart, name your skeleton. Just name it before the Lord. The Lord knows. Just quietly name it. A hurt, an offense, a sin, whatever it might be. Just lay it before the Lord. And now we're going to take that and Lord, we're going to bring it to the foot of the cross and we're going to allow the blood of Jesus to cover even that skeleton and we're going to bury that skeleton right there Lord we confess it as our sin and Lord we are now choosing to get up to leave it there Lord you have forgiven us of so much Lord we now are ready to forgive the one that hurt us the situation Lord, we're asking for forgiveness of the sins that we're laying there. Our secret sin that we've laid there that was not never secret to you. Lord, we lay it at your feet. And we thank you for the forgiveness as we confess to you our sin. And now we stand up walking fresh, leaving it right there. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for a fresh start. In Jesus' name, amen. Those of you that have laid those down, remember the Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Man, it's done. That skeleton is done. The enemy's going to come to you and bring it up. Say, oh, no, that's at the foot of the cross. I put that at the foot of the cross under the blood of Jesus. It's done. It's a done deal. you got nothing in me. And we go on. Shining bright for Jesus Christ. May God bless you guys. 